Welcome to Cultura Latina. This week we're having two different cultural expressions from Mexico and Ecuador, plus a very special trip to the Middle East for a taste of their incredible food history. Join us. Artisan toy making in Mexico is a major part of their cultural identity. Let's take a look on how this colorful tradition stays alive among new technologies and markets. Come see. Yo soy Carlos Rojas. Este, pertenezco y a un grupo. I am Carlos Rojas. My brother Richard and I belong to a group called the Chintentes. We rescue, promote, and make traditional toys. Chintete is a word used in the states of Guerrero, Oaxaca, and Tlaxcala, to name a type of lizard. And then we discovered also that the word in the indigenous Zapotec language means moving toy. As the Chintetes, we maintain a very special tradition of those toys that are now gone, and those toys that we had in our childhood but that are also now gone. We have noticed that we started rapidly and surprisingly what you will begin to see that all these toys that have come to our country have diverse origins that are not necessarily from Mexico. Let's dance, crazy old man! <laughs> My name is Alvaro, and I make artisan toys. And the shop where I work is the Tlamax Cali Workshop, directed by Jasmin Juarez Flores. Oh, the boss, I am the helper. Jasmin Juarez Flores, ay, la jefa. Yo soy el chalán. My name is Jasmin Juarez. I make traditional toys and paper mache artisanry. My name is Katia Wakiauti. I'm Chilean, and I stumbled across the workshop by fate. I entered and started talking to Alvaro and Hasmin, and the next day I signed up, just like that, full time. Our name comes from the indigenous language Nahuatl, and it means house of a thousand colors. We work here every day, and the people who pass by can come in and participate in workshops. We teach them paper mache, how to work with wooden toys, and we also organize workshops in other spaces, cultural centers, in communities, and in hospitals. A good toy maker always sells illusions, and everyone is always willing to be seduced by illusions. And that's why I keep thinking toys produce very good health, good health. When we do something we love, we do it with affection. It is not the same when someone is forcing you to sew shirts and blouses, pants and trousers for a store. In each of the pieces you produce, you put your feelings in it, the emotions that you have at that time. As I have training in the arts, what happens deep down inside when one works with their hands is that you put a lot of heart and love into the piece. But when it comes to sell it, to hand it over to another person, when it leaves you, it's no longer yours. It no longer remains your treasure that you created. There's a type of detachment. Here we are in a workshop where we produce every day and every day something is sold. It becomes detached. One becomes accustomed to that constant detachment. It is something you are making, but in the end will be sold. It is something you create for someone else, not for yourself. It is an experience of separation. It is not a work of art, it is a toy. Laughter releases endorphins. So then what is the role of the toy? To sell more toys, so that people can laugh more and recuperate faster. It's like a vindication of our right to play, to get away from the machine, the maelstrom, the matrix. We are in this state of waking up early, going to work, coming home from work, watching the kids for a while, and continuing the same. But these toys shake us out of that routine a bit and remind us that we are human and we have a right to leisure, the right to play. You may think that it will all disappear because everyone wants a tablet or PCP or Xbox, or you can think of it as an oasis in the desert. Despite all this technology, all those devices do not interact with anyone. All you do is view the screen, and that's all you do. 
But if you have a traditional toy, you can imagine stories with it, you can play with it, you can interact with it. There is a form of rescue where we say that we are not going to produce as if it were a factory. Rather, this is a workshop that operates with manual labor, and that is a form of resistance. To rescue something that has been halfway asleep is a form of resistance. All of those other small acts of resistance that, that other artisans perform, what the weavers do or those who work with leather, they are activities that seek to break with the system that has us half blind, that fractures us and reduces solidarity. Many people who see our work always ask us, ah, really, children like these things and get excited. No, because on the one hand we cannot compete nor have interest to compete with the current toy industry. No. But yes, in the sense that today's toys reveal many things the child today is eager to know. It's like what Einstein said, when you reveal the secret of a toy to a child and they become excited, they become like a small god. The Ecuadorian capital holds a remarkable ancient history. A proof of that is the Ricamba ruins next to the Pichincha volcano, a place with an archaeological and ecological value. Come see. The Rumipamba ruins are located on the slope of the Pichincha volcano and was today the city of Quito. Here you will find an archaeological and ecological site containing vast forests and trails, artifacts and ruins of the Quitus. This ancient wonder dates back as far as 2,200 years before current era. This place is very important historically, in terms of archaeology in the whole country, not just in Quito. But for archaeological investigations that began more than 20 years ago, it's thought that these were the first populations near the city of Quito. This is now the metropolitan district of Quito. This site is dated 2,200 years before Christ, until 1,500 in the Common Era. It is without a doubt a strategic site. We have here behind us the Pinchincha volcano, and to the south is the Rumipampa Gorge that comes down from the volcano. And it is possible that this reached the Iñaquito Laguna that was there, where the city is now. It was a very important laguna. So the fact that there is a settlement here is due to its geography. It is also very fertile earth that is easy to cultivate and with social organization that we can see in the archaeological ruins that took advantage of the geography and this wonderful territory. And now it is here in the heart of the city. The ruins of Rumipamba were uncovered 20 years ago with the urban expansion of Quito. Today it attracts some 50,000 visitors annually. Archaeologists on site have been able to defer aspects of their cosmovision through the artifacts found around the homes, tombs, and work and spiritual spaces of the Quitus. This is a recreation of what were surely homes, or what archaeologists call the bohios of the people of Rumipampa. They have circular forms, and there was always a bonfire, and the fire in the center of the home. It's the circular form of the planets. When you look to the horizon, it is a circular shape. So it seems that this settlement was related to its positioning, and the notion that the uterus of the earth is a great uterus that brings us closer, it protects us. It is thought that the Quitus inhabiting the site left and returned five times due to eruptions of the Pichincha and other surrounding volcanoes. The Quitus returned to this site, often bringing their dead with them. The location is strategic due to its sweeping views of the valley, but it also has fertile soil apt for growing corn, potatoes, and beans. At this site, we see that this was a room of a house that is the oldest that we find here. It was a square room, not like the round one that we just saw. Remember that the others were dated around 500 to 1,500 years before the Common Era. This is 4,000 years old. And it's also very important that at this site, the landslide can be seen. This great quantity of rock, of ash, of mud that came down from the eruptions of the Pinchincha volcano took with it whatever came in its path, including this house. Surely the landslide took it. 
This is the evidence of the landslides and the most important of the Rumipamba here. The Rumipamba Interpretation Center has prioritized educational initiatives from an early age as part of an effort to protect national patrimony. By allowing children to enter the site and interact with the archaeolocal character, the institution seeks to teach the importance of protecting national patrimony, archaeological methods, and the history of the region. The patrimonial proposal was not very close to children. The educational objectives through archaeology, through workshops, are significant. We make children here from a very young age be conscious of this and know what is patrimony and what its non-economic value is, what is its cultural and emotional value. Children live this. They know that Quito was born here, that their, their great-great-great-grandparents lived, and from a young age we achieved this. Ruby Pamba seeks to bring visitors closer to what was pre-Hispanic and pre-Inca Quito through educational initiatives, tours, and trails open to the public. Today we're making a very special trip to the Gaza Strip where the Turkish, Syrian, and Persian influences are very present in, in the traditional foods. Take a look. Palestinian cuisine has a long history of influences coming from Persian and Turkish dishes, as well as other Levantine cuisines, including Lebanese, Syrian, and many other places in the Middle East. Here in the Gaza Strip, most of the meals are accompanied by saj, a bread also known as shrak or markouk. This is a type of flat bread that is baked on a domed metal griddle. There is many things in our culture that brings some comfort to our heart. al sag bread is a taste of our great history, and it reminds us with the good days with our grandparents. It's easy to make it and delicious to eat. Palestinians have handed down the recipe for saj from generation to generation because it is the easiest to make in times of hardships such as war, migration or displacement. All circumstances Palestinians have suffered historically. Today, Palestinian families in the Gaza Strip use saj bread in many different ways. Some cook it with rice and yogurt to make a delicious mansaf dish. Others soak it in meat or chicken stock to create Palestinian fatta, or stuff it with chicken, onion, and sumac to make musakhan rolls. Each day we sell hundreds of saj bread packages, and it can be easily done during war times on the wood fire, as most of the times during the conflicts we rarely get electricity to turn on the bread machines. Every day when I go back home and I have to bring some for my family, they love it. Many restaurants around the Gaza Strip have begun using saj bread in shawarma, shish tawuq, and kebab sandwiches to bring an old Palestinian traditional flavor to modern Mediterranean cuisine. Thanks for watching. Next week we'll be back with another taste in Latin American culture. See you then.